Ever wonder what Christianity was like under the apostles? Here's Tony Bosserman to give you a glimpse into original Christianity. Throughout your Bible, woman is used as a symbol of religion, true religion, and sometimes false religion. In the Old Testament, we read about the congregation of Israel, a holy people to God, entering into a marital agreement with God. And it's described in the book of Exodus, chapter 19, where God and Israel actually exchange vows. God promising to bless and protect Israel, and Israel responding by saying, All that the Lord has commanded, we will do. We read something similar in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 where the Apostle Paul talks about the church as the bride of Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself makes a vow saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we make a vow to Jesus Christ in baptism, accepting him as our personal Savior, our Lord and Master, and our soon coming King. And in the book of Revelation chapter 19, we read of the marriage supper in which the church then formally marries Jesus Christ. But woman is also symbolic of false religion. We read about it in the Old Testament with Jezebel, a pagan priestess who marries King Ahab and introduces to Israel false gods and, of course, pagan rituals. We also read in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, of a great harlot who is also symbolic of false religion, as we're going to see on today's edition of Original Christianity. Turn with me to Hosea chapter 2 and verse 5. Can a woman, a church, actually commit adultery? Well, absolutely. The congregation of Israel was very unfaithful to God, you know, worshiping other gods, the false gods of the nations around her. But more than that, they entered into agreements with the nations around them, looking to them to help them instead of God Almighty. And so in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, Bring charges against your mother, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. She who conceived them have behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen and my oil. And then it goes on to talk about the fact that she forgot, she didn't realize that God is the one who gave her all those things, you know, through rain and due season, etc., So Israel strayed from God in two ways, not only, again, going after false gods and lovers in that sense, but then entering into agreements with nations, and that's called fornication on a national level in the pages of your Bible. So let's go to Revelation 17, where it talks about the great harlot, and it uses some of this language. It says in Revelation 17, Verse 1, I, Christ, will show you, John, the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And if you do a study of that word waters, it can mean literally waters, or it can mean, you know, metaphorically nations. And we see an example of that in Isaiah 17, verses 12 and 13. He goes on to say, the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And so there's this wine that is a symbol of something that kings of the earth want, nations of the earth want, and they're willing to enter into an agreement with her, enter into a fornicating type relationship with her in order to get it. It says, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And in last week's program, we talked about this seven-headed beast and the fact that it was symbolic of seven kingdoms that have come and gone. The Egyptian kingdom, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, the Roman, and the Islamic empires. And so this woman is said to ride that beast. And so we'll get into the details of this in a moment. But it says the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. And when you think about it, you know, priests and priestesses are usually 
uh, dressed in these types of clothing, very flashy, you know, lots of ornaments, lots of colors, bright colors, etc. Having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication, and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots, and the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. So that's a lot to digest. There's a lot there that helps to identify who this woman is, and we're going to break it down for you in today's program. Let's begin with the last verse of Revelation 17, verse 18, where it says, The woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over, and actually the Greek word echoe means held or hold, kind of holding sway over the kings of the earth. And so when a woman mounts a horse or a camel and she takes the reins, well, she's going to direct that animal in the direction she wants it to go, right? But here, a woman is described as riding this seven-headed beast, having some kind of sway or influence over, in this case, all seven of these kingdoms. So what city in history can be said to hold sway or to have some kind of influence over all seven of those kingdoms? Well, there's really only one, and that is Babel. And it's described, of course, way back in the book of Genesis chapter 11. So let's turn there. Genesis 11, in verse 5, says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. This is what they begin to do, and now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore the name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And so today you can go online and learn language through a company called Babel. And they have all the different languages available that you can learn. And it goes back to Genesis chapter 11. But what really happened there? Well, you know, the Bible says three times that God is the one who drew the borders of the nations. And it really started right here. Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 talks about angels actually leading the peoples, the nations, to the places that God wanted them to habitate. And so, you know, various angels were assigned to take peoples you know, different ethnic groups now with different languages to Asia and, of course, to Africa and other parts of the world. And remember that at this time, even scientists agree that the world was maybe one large continent and then, of course, broke up, you know, in these days to what we see today as the seven different continents. So with them, what did they take? Well, they took the practices that they learned in Babel. And of course, the Tower of Babel was built for two reasons. And that was, of course, to escape any future flood that God might give or bring upon the people of the earth. And secondarily, it was used as an astrological observatory, a place to worship. The top of it is felt to have been a place of worship. And an altar was there to worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19, God gives this warning to the people of Israel. He says, Take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, you feel driven to worship them, which the Lord has given to all the peoples under the heavens. So this whole thing of astrology and worshiping stars and moon and the sun and having different names for them started here at Babel. And then when God dispersed the different ethnic groups to their various places, they took with them these practices of worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars. 
And so when God called Israel out of Egypt, who was one of the nations that was observing and, of course, worshiping the sun, moon, and stars, God says, I don't want you to do that. You see, that would be spiritual adultery, which when you think about it, that's what idolatry is, isn't it? Spiritual adultery. And so we go after other gods instead of the true God. And God wants us to worship him and him only, to be faithful to him as we are faithful to our mates. And so we're supposed to live that way. And Israel is commanded not to worship the sun, moon, and stars. And so these are the practices that we see all the nations in history involved in. And so we read then in Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 19, O you daughter dwelling in Egypt, speaking of Naph, Naph was the city of Memphis, not Tennessee, but Egypt, Memphis, Egypt. And it was the center of worship in that nation. And remember that Egypt was the first head of the seven-headed beast. So Naph, N-O-P-H, or Memphis as it's known, was the harlot city that rode the first head of the seven-headed beast. If you go to the book of Nahum, chapter 3, and verses 4 to 7, you're going to read about the seductive harlot. And that's the way the city of Nineveh was described. And so the city of Nineveh was the harlot city that uh, rode the second head of the seven-headed beast, and that was the kingdom of Assyria. Then, of course, we read about Babylon itself, and Babylon is called the daughter the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter 50, it says, they come like men in battle formation to attack you, daughter Babylon. So Babylon is the daughter of Babel in the same way that Naph and, of course, Nineveh are daughters of this great harlot. Why? Because they took with them the worship of the sun, moon, and stars. And so that's the relationship being talked about here. And so Babylon was the harlot city that rode the third and the fourth heads of the seven-headed beast. And that would have been the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire. Then we read in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 16, that Paul was in Athens, and he was amazed how the city was given over to idols. And we know from history that Athens was the harlot city, It's where we get Greek mythology. It was the harlot city that ran or steered or sat upon, you could say, the fifth head of the seven-headed beast, which was the kingdom of Greece. And then, of course, we know that Rome is the city, and later Vatican City was involved as well, in riding the Roman Empire, the sixth head of the seven-headed beast. And then finally, we have Mecca. Mecca was the religious city that steered the seventh head of the seventh headed beast, and that, of course, was Islam, the Islamic Empire and the Islamic Caliphates. So these are the different kingdoms, the seven kingdoms that we've talked about that make up the seven headed beast, and these are the cities that were involved in riding that beast. So which of these seven cities is going to be the one that is riding the beast in the final days? In other words, which harlot city is going to ride the eighth beast, which is of the seven, but is one that is coming in the future? That's what we'll deal with and answer, and we'll take a look at six or seven identifying signs of that particular city being Mecca. We'll do that right after this. No one would deny that a major part of the COVID-19 effect has been to bring an eerie silence over the earth throughout much of 2020. Empty streets, business offices, churches, schools, stadiums and parks, with billions of people sheltering in place, have dramatically lowered the decibel level generated by human beings throughout the world. Another part of the COVID-19 effect has been to greatly curb people's activity levels, resulting in an unparalleled, restful state in cities and countries everywhere. In retrospect, the year 2020 may be dubbed the year the Earth stood still. What most people are not aware of is that this COVID-19 effect was foretold in advance over 2,500 years ago, and it is the first of eight major events to come. 
It was all revealed by the most accurate political forecaster in the history of mankind. Read Foretold and find out what's coming after the COVID-19 effect. To order your copy of Foretold the COVID-19 effect, visit OriginalChristianityReview.com or find us on Amazon. We've been talking about the fact that woman is used as a symbol in your Bible of true religion and false religion. And we looked at one of the false religions that's talked about coming on this earth in the future in the book of Revelation chapter 17. She's called the great harlot and she's the mother of harlots. And in verse 18 of Revelation 17, we saw that the great harlot is a great city that rides the beast. And so that city was Babel, because it's the only city in history that is said from the pages of your Bible to have influence over all of these different kingdoms. And we saw how by spawning harlot cities, harlot cities that are religious centers of worship and that hold sway over kings of the earth. And so back in the book of Galatians chapter 4 and verse 22, we actually read about woman as a symbol of true religion and false religion. The Apostle Paul gives this kind of cryptic message using metaphors. He says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman, which things are symbolic. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And remember that Hagar was Sarah's handmaid, and because Sarah was without child, she had Abraham marry Hagar and go into her. And of course, they had a child, Ishmael. And so this Hagar is symbolic of Mount Sinai in Arabia. And that, of course, is symbolic now of the religion of Islam. And it corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage. And that, of course, would be the Jewish religion with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. And that is symbolic of the church, Christianity. So in this metaphor, Paul refers to all three of those religions. And again, you know, cementing the foundation that uh, religion is symbolized by woman in the Bible. So what city will ride the eighth and final beast? Remember, the eighth is of the seven. One of these seven kingdoms is going to rise again. And with her, you know, one of these uh, cities. And I'm going to show you from the pages of your Bible that I think it will not only be Islam that will, of course, be the beast, but it will be Mecca that will be the final Babylon, you know, the city of religion that is the center of that kingdom. And so we read in the book of Isaiah, chapter 21, a prophecy against the desert by the sea. And the desert by the sea is considered, at least by some theologians, to be the Arabian Peninsula, now modern-day Saudi Arabia. So it goes on to say, like whirlwinds sweeping through the south land, and that's another way that Arabia is referred to in the pages of your Bible, an invader comes from the desert, from a land of terror. Elam is mentioned, and Media. It says the Elam attack, and Media lay siege. Well, Elam and Media, if you look them up in a Bible dictionary, are modern-day Iran. And they're part of the king of the north in the final days. And so the king of the north is going to attack the king of the south, which is Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and eventually take control of these areas. So it goes on to say, I, the Lord, will bring to an end all the groaning that she, and it's referring to a city there, caused. And then it goes on to say, Babylon has fallen. So why do we read that statement, Babylon has fallen, in Arabia? Well, it's because Mecca is the final Babylon that the Bible talks about in detail. And again, there's many clues. This is backed up in Isaiah 13, verse 19 and 20, where it says, In Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited. 
nor will the Arabian pitch his tent there. So it doesn't say, nor will the you know, German pitch their tents there, or the Russian. It says the Arabian. So these two texts in Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 21, and I encourage you to read both chapters, you know, certainly point to a Babylon of the future that is going to be laid waste like Sodom and Gomorrah, and it is the future Babylon, and it's in Arabia. So that's the first point. The first identifying sign is that Babylon is in Arabia, according to these texts. Then we have this in Jeremiah 51, and I encourage you to take the time, read Revelation 17 and 18 with Jeremiah 50 and 51. These are the four chapters, two in the Old Testament, two in the New, that talk the most about mystery Babylon, and of course the Babylon of the future. So Jeremiah 51 verse 13 says, you who dwell by many waters, abundant in treasures, and your end has come. And so it's talking about Babylon, if you look at the context there, both chapters 50 and 51 of Jeremiah. And so this is that future Babylon, and it gives us a hint. It says that she dwells, this city dwells, by many waters. And so a lot of people thought maybe it was Rome because Rome, of course, dwells near, about 40 miles off the coast of the Adriatic Sea, and of course, the Mediterranean Sea. Well, the same could be said of Mecca, who, of course, is off the coast of the Red Sea, the Arabian Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the Indian Ocean. So it qualifies just as well, doesn't it? And then we have this in Jeremiah 51, 42. The sea will rise over Babylon. Its roaring waves will cover her. Now that would be you know, quite a feat for two cities that lie inland about 40 miles. And yet advocates of a European beast with Rome as the city that's riding the beast have no problem with the waters somehow reaching her and overcoming her. Well, the same could happen from the Red Sea and it could happen through an earthquake. And of course, an earthquake is described, isn't it? in the pages of your Bible as something that's going to happen in the end times, an earthquake that's unparalleled in human history. It's going to affect the whole earth. The whole earth is going to shake. And it says that uh, you know the cry of people is going to be heard at the Red Sea. Take a look at it in Jeremiah 49. So that's a second sign is that the city the last Babylon that rides the eighth head of the seven-headed beast is dwelling by many waters. And then we have in Jeremiah 51, verse 44, this statement, I will punish Bel, the god, in Babylon, and the nation shall not stream to him anymore. You know that Mecca is the most visited city on the face of the earth? That's right, more people stream to Mecca than any other city on earth. And so this could very well be talking about Mecca. And it's another sign that points to Mecca being that last Babylon. Then we read in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 3 this statement, The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. It doesn't tell us here what the abundance of that luxury is, but we know that Saudi Arabia is the largest producer of oil in the world. It's currently number one. The United States was number one for a few years under the Trump administration, but now it's back to second place. And so Saudi Arabia, its primary export, you could say, the way that it makes money is through oil. And so the nations of the earth get their oil from OPEC, which of course Saudi Arabia leads. Two-thirds of the world's oil flows through OPEC. Now, it's a very interesting fact that if you see crude oil in a wine glass, you would think it was a burgundy. And remember, back in Revelation 17, we read that uh, the whole world is drunk with the wine of her fornication. 
And so all the world is fornicating with Saudi Arabia. How? Well, because they have to agree to have mosques built in their country if they want to buy oil from Saudi Arabia. And so did you know that over the last 30 years, we've had 800 plus mosques built here in this country? And so that is a fornication relationship, you know, mutual satisfaction. And so that is an identifying sign. And then, of course, we have this in Isaiah 47, 1. Go down, sit in the dust, virgin daughter, Babylon. Take off your veil, lift up your skirts, bear your legs. Your nakedness will be exposed and your shame uncovered. I, God, will take vengeance. Did you know that there is a covering over the Kaaba stone at the center of Mecca? And it's a veil. And it is made of pure silk and it is embroidered with gold. And the last one cost over $5 million to make. And of course, after Ramadan, it is cut up into little pieces and it is taken away by some of the people who visit, usually the dignitaries, to Mecca. And so this could very well be speaking of that. Obviously, there's a veil or covering or skirt involved. And it's another sign that points to Mecca being this last Babylon. Then we have this in Revelation 17, verse 16. The ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So eventually the secular wing, you could say, of the beast turns on the harlot that is riding her and burns her to the ground. We read about this in more detail in Jeremiah 51, 24, where it says, Before your eyes, I, God, will repay Babylon and all who live in Babylonia for all the wrong they have done in Zion, that's Jerusalem. Prepare the nations for battle against her, Ararat, Mini, and Ashkenaz. Notice it doesn't start with Munich or Moscow. No, it starts with Ararat, and we know that that's a mountain in modern-day Turkey. And again, I talked about this in the last program on the beast, and I went into detail that Turkey is the nation to watch in prophecy because it is the nation that leads these coalition of nations against the harlot and, of course, before that, against Jerusalem. So in Zechariah's seventh vision, he sees a woman being taken in a basket to the land of Shinar. Well, that's where Babel was built. And so it is showing us that the harlot is going to be carried back to its place of origin. And that's another clue, isn't it? That Babel was the great harlot that sits on many waters. If you want to learn more about the great harlot, go to originalchristianityreview.com, press the text Tony button, give me your address, and I'll send you a free copy of my book. So remember, if original Christianity was good enough for Jesus and the disciples, it should be good enough for you and me. Thanks for watching.